few minutes late start. It started with me getting stuck in traffic on the way, on the way here. Um, thanks for being here tonight, or this afternoon, soon to be tonight. My name is Mike Wakeford. I am chair of uh, New Winston Museum, and I just want to give you a, uh, just, inter uh, just welcome you on behalf of the museum, and then I'll turn things over to Marcus in just a moment. Uh, just to say a couple things, we're, we're uh, pleased to be here at Parkway uh, United. Uh, Pastor Craig Shaw, I think, is over there, um, and thanks for making this uh, space available to us for the event um, this evening. It's been, what, uh, some of you know, New Winston is between homes right now, um, and uh, one thing that that has uh, led us to do is to take our programs on the road out into different spaces in the community, churches being one of the one of the uh, common landing spots, and that's actually proven to be a really fun and um, productive uh, thing for us, thing for us to do, uh, get into new places and meet new friends. So thank you for being here. Um, this is the second event of the salon of our current salon series, uh, which is uh, takes place under the banner name of Food Ways to Community. Tonight's uh, the next panel is uh, titled Farming and Land Preservation. Uh, this whole series is co-sponsored with the Forsyth Community uh, Food Consortium, and thanks to Marcus for being part of this whole um, this whole series. Uh, we're still basking in the afterglow of the awesome event with uh, Michael Twitty at uh, Old Salem just about a month ago, which was spectacular. Um, Let's see. Just a couple other quick, uh, quick announcements. Uh, the third, the third and final event in this series will be on April 19th at 5:30 at United Metropolitan Missionary Baptist Church. Um, that's going to be. That's called Restaurants, Caterers, and Community Integration. If you want to make sure you remember this, take one of these cards when you um, when you go home, and they're on the table out there. And take a second one if you have a bulletin board at work to put it on, or at your church or somewhere else. Um, we've got plenty of these, and we'd love to spread the word for the final uh, program. Um, one other one other upcoming event, just to add to that, on April twelfth. April 12th from 4 p.m. to 8 p.m. at the Center for Design Innovation. Um, we are going to be present, a kind of co-presenting co um, at the North Carolina Science Festival, which the CDI is hosting a local iteration of the, of the North Carolina Science Festival. And we will be there for the whole stretch from 4 p.m. to 8 p.m. along with the folks from the Gallons Family Farm. Um, out in out in uh, Davidson County, and we'll be there. They'll be teaching folks about the science of compost, um, and we'll be there uh, talking about the Gallons family and their long tradition in the food culture of the uh, of this community. So we're looking forward to that. And keep your eyes out for. I know there's going to be quite a bit of promotion about that science festival at Center for Design Innovation. But just know that if you come out there, you'll. You'll see some. You'll, you'll see new Winston folks as well. So, with that, um, again, just thanks to our panelists for um, for being here. Thanks, Marcus, for putting it together. And enjoy. Thank you. Good early evening, everyone. Can you hear me, okay? Good evening. Uh, uh, yeah. So, my name is Marcus Hill. I am with the Forsyth Community Food Consortium. We're a local food policy council. Um, one of about 30 across the state of North Carolina. We tend to focus on promoting healthy communities and stronger local economies through local food. Um, I co-hosting this with the New Winston Museum, as Mike said, the, um, the, the kind of nexus of this, this food waste to community conversation uh, is something that's very near and dear to my heart. And, and to the, the, the food consortium and the way that we're kind of approaching this idea of the local food movement and food system development work. Um, and that you can't you know, distinguish, food. you can't take food out of community, you can't take meat out of food. They're both these two intersectional pieces uh, that kind of co-create each other in these really fantastic, fabulous ways. And so you know, the idea of, of food, of tradition, of preservation, uh, I really wanted to, to bring some people I really care about that have been huge for me in the local food movement here to kind of speak to this through the work that they're doing, the thoughts that they have and the vision that they're kind of pursuing, and kind of eliminate that for all of us tonight. Um, and so it's not a very technical uh, talk in the sense of zoning or land trusts and that kind of preservation, but very much about like getting hands in the soil, in the community, bringing these things together, and, you know, what this, uh, how can we kind of push Winston and the surrounding areas toward a more complete vision of 
food, community, connection, blah, blah, blah. So that was, that was kind of my excitement there. And so I hope you're all excited too. And I'm really glad you all came out. I have, I have bios that I would love to read you all. Um, and just to get a better idea of, of who, who all is in front of you tonight. So I'm going to start with Natalie first. Natalie was actually my introduction to Winston-Salem back in you know, 2002, 2003. And I definitely would not be here without her fantastic Willy Wonka like tour guide. <laughs> um, all right, so Natalie is a Winston-Salem and owner of Sun Gold Farm located in southeast, southeast Winston-Salem. Uh, Peace Corps stint in Mali, West Africa, amongst, amongst subsist subsistence farmers after a bachelor's degree in anthropology from Wake Forest, turned her on to the agricultural way of life. After two years of internships in Pennsylvania and one in Georgia, she came back to Winston to start farming at home. After a small venture of seven organics at Frank's perennial border, she managed Sugar Creek Farm, an organic vegetable growing operation in Davie County for three years. And in 2014, Sungold Farm was born, operating out of Greenbrook Farm on Thomasville Road here in Winston. This is the second year of land ownership as she and her boyfriend on venture into acreage ownership and transitioning the farming operation to the backyard. You have pamphlets on the table right outside the door that you all can grab um, with more information. All right, and then Eric Jackson also born in Weston Salem, North Carolina, raised in the Northwest Forsyth County Township of Pofftown. He is a descendant of Bethania, Moravian community and a longtime resident of Winston Salem. Eric is predominantly self-taught, learning through experience as part of an urban pioneering music and arts community that took root as the warehouse in downtown Winston Salem, now affectionately known as Cranky's for the most part, and then later uh, attempted a small farm entrepreneur on his grandparents' farm in Pofftown. He studied horticulture technology at Forsyth Technical Community College, earning certificates in landscape management, greenhouse production, nursery production and management, landscape and design, all with a focus on learning to use plants for ecological design and restoring biodiversity for future generations. It's fantastic. Uh, he has a certificate of permaculture designed from we, all, we Are All Farmers Permaculture Institute and is also graduated from the North Carolina Extension Services Piedmont Farm School. He is currently the head gardener at Old Salem Museum and Gardens, where he has worked for the past eight years tending historic garden rec recreations and stewarding a corresponding historic plant and seed collection. So that is Eric. All right, Michael Banner. Michael Banner is a stabilizing force in our community. Since returning home from prison in 2003, he is now settled with a beautiful family, has earned degrees in nanotechnology and mechanical engineering from Forsyth Technical Community College, and over the last eight years has provided greater food security and income to his family, all vegetarians, as a certified urban farmer through the North Carolina Cooperative Extension. He is currently overseeing the Island Cultures Urban Farming and Farmers Market over in East Winston, leading a food consortium action team. He's recently appointed and serves as the chairman for Winston-Salem's new Urban Food Policy Council, a member of North Carolina's Farm Farmers Cooperative, Far Farmers for Justice, a community advocate and an active co-parent with Shawnee to his three children. Most of his 15, forgive the pronouns. Yeah, he was in there. Yeah. Uh, also, was that? Oh, okay. Well, I mean, this is pretty good. Like North Carolina's 2016 spelling bee champ. That's I don't want to leave that out. Uh, Fatima, who is eight, and Niara, right. uh, who is five. Michael, 43, is strong and focused, hardworking, and a motivating force in Western Salem. He is, he is beloved and well known in this community for turning his life around and being committed to our food security. He participates in multiple disciplines of organic growing, composting, worm farming, and raising chickens for eggs. He is a man of his word, responsible, and passionate about social justice issues. He is, he is a man's man, and a true gentleman, <laughs> wonderfully unique human being in Winston Salem. Winston Salem is lucky to have Michael. Very, very well said. <laughs> all right, so thank you all for uh, for joining us. Um, <clears throat> do I need a microphone? You guys okay? All right, I'm gonna just see if you guys want to pass it around. All right, so I would love to start with just a bit of the history and how you all kind of got into the paths that you're
current work stone. I know that you mentioned a little bit in your bio, but if you want to dig into a little bit more, like what were, what were the driving forces and motivations there? Um, <coughs> excuse me. So I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Mali, in West Africa. It's kind of landlocked uh, north of, like, touching Guinea and Ivory Coast, it's, and it's completely surrounded in Burkina Faso and Algeria. But the, they only got about 11 inches of water a year, and when it all came, it all came at once, and it came really hard and was very destructive. And so going from that environment where you try to plant rice in the higher portions, that dry rice, and then hope that if the water floods too much, then that'll get, that'll, that'll come to cultivation, or if it floods, like just stays in the bottom, and then you plant the wet rice in the bottom, transplanting it out there. So you, it's, it's a hard way of life, and then if you have the money, then you can go to the neighboring town and rent the, like a, a pump to rent out, and you need like, six or seven people to manhandle this tube and get the, the water up to the top. So my friend uh, Mokhtar and I tried to tried to do it for for one season and it was impossible. And we also didn't know what we were doing and we were in flip flops and there's like all these spiky things everywhere and the, the calluses had not yet formed and it was, a, it was a mess but it gave me a huge appreciation for people that make their living and the existence off of that. Um, and then going from 11 inches of water to here in winston town which I actually don't know. I was just thinking, like, I don't know how many inches of it here. So anybody had that number that you 43, yeah. And so having that difference in when we've got all the technology we need, I was like, you can grow anything here. Like, in, in comparison, like, the just the differences is amazing. Um, so then after I got a little taste of what that was like, and that was not my actual my, I was trained as a natural resource management volunteer, and so went in thinking we were gonna be grafting mangoes. We learned how to graft mangoes and have all these cool varieties and do rock lines and slow down the erosion when it does come to kind of lessen the impact and get less of that silt in the, eventually in the, in the farms that kind of accumulates downhill. And then I got to the um, Chinchinome, and they were really interested in like a millet grinder and like different kind of products. So we did a little bit of uh, natural resources. We grew a lot of marine fair plants, which actually grow here in Winston-Salem as an annual. And those are called the miracle plants. It's like the, they have uh, more, like the leaves are, have more iron than spinach, more potassium than bananas, more all kinds of stuff. You take the seeds and then you, you make a powder out of them and drop it in the water and it coagulates all the things that are floating around in there so it purifies water. It's like, it's awesome. And there's a gentleman here in town called Livingstone and he sells the German pelleted form, like not pelleted. Capsules. Capsules, yeah. thank you. That's the non -hack. So, um, and capsules and it's pretty, it's, it's awesome. But anyhow, so I got into, to, those grow really well in Niger, but they, and, the, and the people in Niger really use them in all different kinds of ways. But in Mali, it, for some reason, it was only the people that had lived in Niger that brought back like this time you cook with it. So we would have like group like get togethers and like let's cook with moringa today or whatnot. And then uh, we grew a lot of neem trees and, and neem is like really great for like pesticides and all kinds of things, but it's number one like really, major benefit over there was the, the shade that it created. And so like shade trees in the really hot sun was huge. So um, I'm getting completely off the topic of normal, but. Can you spell the one that started with the M? Moringa, M-O-R-I-N-G-A. Okay. Yep. Um, and so, so I really wanted to, coming back to Winston, well I knew that I really wanted to do more agriculture. And then I did an internship in, at the Rodale Institute in Pennsylvania, and they compare um, organic and conventional farming side by side. And you have to measure things and weigh things, and it, we were seeing how much difference, like very, various varieties of cover crops would have, um, uh, different combinations would have on the soil fertility. And so I realized that I really do not like data collection. And I'd rather just do things instead of write down and document and, and be very detail-oriented, which I'm not. So then uh, the second internship in Pennsylvania was on a farm 
that was production was had a CSA, the um, Community Supported Agriculture, the box program where you just buy it at the beginning of the season and then you just get a box of whatever's in the season. And so I really enjoyed that. And then it wasn't a super well-run farm, so then it was really nice to have another internship at a farm that works really well in, in Georgia. And that was south of Atlanta. It's called Serenby Farm. And it's got an interesting model where they've got 300 acres and they've consolidated all the housing onto like a main street. They've got restaurants and shops. And then instead of being based on like a golf course, there's <coughs> an organic farm. And then there's also a wooded area. So your property then backs up to the woods, the um, like a lake or, or the farm. So people would look out their window and be like, Oh, it looks like uh, we need to wear jackets today. So we were told that that was kind of nice to be able to provide that service. Um, <laughs> we also, <clears throat> then coming back, then I've just been trying to, I wish I'd taken more business classes or something, but I'm just trying to make a, a living off of growing vegetables and sell them at the market and some restaurants. So I'm glad to be in a place where I know a lot of people. And I like Winston's familiar enough that yeah, some of y'all look very familiar, and the others, I look forward to the meeting. So, anyhow, that's me. Thank you. And I will, uh, I'm sure you can plug this too later, but Emily is running a CSA program, so you can buy shares of the upcoming harvest. I just joined, and just putting that out there. Um, Tamakli, you want to <coughs> tell us how you got into what your path looks like, how you got into food? <coughs> I think, um, of course, my mother, she would be the main motivation for me getting into farming. Um, just my love for food and her love for feeding people, and um, especially her sons. And um, actually, when I, when I was gone away to prison, I had turned to a vegetarian probably um, four years before I came home. And um, when I come home, it was more like a culture shock to my family because they used to me eating certain types of foods. And um, I think my mom even got offended, like some of her dishes that were go-tos I wouldn't eat. And um, I knew then it would probably, I didn't know I was gonna be a farmer, but um, I knew that I had to find a way to support my, my eating because you know, I was a, um, a public transportation. I, I, I caught the bus a lot and things of that nature, so in East Winston or the South Side, there's not a lot of um, organic foods, and they don't really serve uh, they don't really serve a healthy uh, palate of food. So I used to go to Whole Foods a lot, and, and I see the prices, and it was breaking me. So um, it was it was kind of it was a, it was a dilemma to be figured out, and in time, you know. I, I, I do, lately, I was thinking about this like the last couple of nights, and I was like, a lot of my um, success, so-called success, I had to attribute to even just what I eat. And um, one of my mentors, uh, Brother Hashim, uh, plays the drums, the um, Otasha dance ensemble, he, um, he used to always tell me, you know, because he, he, he's a healthy eater as well, he's not a vegetarian. But um, he used to always tell me, you know, whoever feeds you controls you. So he used to always continuously tell me that, you know what I mean? And, um, you know, just being even uh, economical, you know, being a vegetarian, and then also loving beans and rice. So it was, it was, it was pretty easy for me to fall into, uh, um, you know, being able to speak on, you know, the benefits of being a vegetarian. It's, it's not ex as expensive as some would make it out to be. And um, in due time, you know, as I was going through school and, you know, people say, okay, he, he eats over there, all of us over here, because a lot of times I'd be the only, only vegetarian in the room or in my class or whatever. And um, it started being somewhat of an isolated type of feeling. You know what I mean? My family hadn't quite been won over yet, and I didn't have my own family yet. So, you know, um, eventually I did get a little rooming house, you know, in the rooming, you know, how they had the rooming houses. And um, I had my room, and I had my own little George Foreman, 
I had my own little, uh, little eye for the stove. And I used to just cook my meals and sit and study. And I became quite proficient in science doing that. You know what I mean? Just eating vegetables and studying. And um, I did also even used to refer a lot to um, the story of Daniel. That was one of my um, most inspirational um, biblical stories, how he um, ate fresh water and vegetables. And um, he was always refusing the king's dainty food. And he was like, I just eat fruit, fresh fruits and vegetables. And um, that I felt like you know that was something that sustained me while I went to college. And I finished pretty well. And when I finished, um, you know, I've been a vegetarian the whole time. But uh, when, I, when I went to finish school, I began to teach school because no one would still give me a job, even though I had a um, high you know, graduation at the top of my class and all that. But even in the end, they said, well, you have a criminal record. And um, they don't consider you know, the source or the reasons or the, how, long ago it, how long ago it was or anything. They just say, you know, so what, you're um, top of the class, like very top. And um, this effort's gonna hold you back. You know what I'm saying? So a woman that told me when I first got out of prison, um, Mary Ann Forehand, she was like an angel, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And um, you know, I used to get uh, almost seemingly persecuted or I used to get berated a lot because my, my language was so strong. And um, when I got out of prison, I was a lot more or a lot less tempered. And um, <laughs> my dreadlocks was flying everywhere, and I'd be in the raft. And I was in front of um, I was in front of the zap board. Who um, they like? They kind of they're the segue when you're getting back into the community. They're, they're going to stick. They're going to sit in front of you as a board. So I was out there, and then they say. Um, if you get caught with a bullet, here's what we'll do to you. If you get caught with a piece of crack, this is what we'll do to you. And they just have all their threats lined up. And then it's like, do all agree? And they'd be like, yay. Yeah. It's like 20 of them. So they really like trying to drop a hammer on me. So I was out there, I was like, you know, I was really challenging them. And um, I remember that day I was hungry. I came down there and um, I didn't know that when I came in, it was gonna lock the doors behind me. So I was already not in the, in the right place of mind. And um, make a long story short, I criticized the, the board, and this woman took it upon herself to write a grant, you know what I'm saying, to put me through school. So that's, that's for the Forsyth Tech. And I'm, I'm a great advocate for Forsyth Tech. I don't get paid for it, but you know what I'm saying? Um, I do believe in graduate from school, getting us a degree that is, you can supposedly go right into the workforce and it didn't take you six years to get it and you're not in debt. So I went there and got some good training, but even in the end, I still couldn't get a job. So I applied, after I did nanotechnology, I applied for a job with um, Carter G. Wilson. I put my son in the school and my son was a vegetarian as I am. And um, it was just something you know, maybe, you know, in, in, the, in the black community, uh, we were a lot slower to catch on to eating vegetables and uh, being healthy. So I would always be kind of like a freak of nature in the room, and my children would be too, because I wouldn't let them eat a lot of stuff with, you know, with, with the other people they ate. And they've kind of softened me up now, but I didn't let them eat candy. I mean, it was very strict, you know what I mean? So all the teachers kind of knew how it was. I taught at the school with my son. And um, I taught there for uh, three plus years. And that was a success because the school I taught at was a revolving door. They didn't keep people past two years, you know what I'm saying? And I was myself the whole time. I told them I don't teach with fear. The students, I can say they actually got, got love for me. I see them in the community. They still refer to me as their teacher. But they fired me on the spot because I defended a, a student. I spoke on her behalf and um, I told her mother that one of her teachers were bullying her. So I know this is all supposed to be about food, but I'm of the mentality that your food really, um, the 
the food determines how you respond to certain certain things. My my diet allowed me to when I was growing up, I might eat anything. Um, just by you know considering what I eat, where it was grown, who grew it, that gave me enough resolve to be able to deal with certain situations where others would panic, and I'd just be like, it's not a big deal. So um, I told the parent that you know her, the teacher was bullying her daughter, and um, they fired me on the spot, and from there I went straight into intense agriculture, what I would call intense. I grew, I grew probably seven gardens. My intents would be helping my friends start their gardens. So I had at least uh, three public gardens and probably four backyard gardens. And uh, by then I had a family of five and I had no job. So um, I just really committed myself more into farming. And uh, all of my learning throughout school has all been reduced to earth. And that's where I do my laboratory experiments, my uh, mechanical engineering, things of that fashion. And um, it's just a culture that I, I really, I really believe in. This is something I share with the people on this panel: um, love for food, um, being able to uh, not necessarily control, but um, have a hand in how your food is grown. I think it's important. And um, it builds camaraderie across the lines. I always um, I try to coin the term, um, uh, the soil, the soil reduces, no, it didn't reduce. The soil neutralizes racism because, you know, even, even coming up through prison or even life itself, you know what I mean? And just knowing you have to have certain mechanisms to survive in society. Either way, regardless of how your heart is, you know what you're facing, you're gonna have to deal with things as is. But, you know, just being, feeling the sting of graduating from the top of my class in mechanical engineering, I'm the only black guy, pardon my expression. Um, but I'm the only person who didn't get a job. So I was really trying to figure that one out. I was holding my chin, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, um, that don't make sense to me. Uh, but that's the way the world is, so let's get back to something that we can all agree on. I'm not as intimidating when I'm in the earth. And um, it's been, it's been a, pleasant, a pleasurable run for me. I have no, no qualms about it. So that's pretty much my story too. Thank you. Um, we, we do have other questions, but Eric, I want to get your take as well. I want to share your story. Uh, um, so I grew up out in Pop Town. Uh, my parents live right next to my grandparents. Uh, they had a, a dairy farm and then they, my grandfather switched to beef. Um, so he had some land out there that was sort of old family land. And um, we grew up like just right down the hill from where my mom grew up. And so I was always just sort of around that. And I, you know, and as a kid, I didn't even realize that we always like, they always had a couple pigs and they grew a big garden and they had the cow. So we always had like meat that was there from the farm that it, in our freezer that I didn't even, wasn't even aware of at the time, but that's how we were, you know, that's what we were eating. And uh, I don't know, as I got, so I just went out, I used to just go out and play out in the, the pasture out there and that was just kind of our backyard and that's where I kind of like fell in love with nature. And, Sort of the time that I was growing up there was when that area was starting to get developed. So I was starting to all these developments were starting to pop up. And so I just became real aware that that could be an eventual, you know, just what I saw in other like farmland turning into just all these developments. And um, so it kind of, I started to feel more protective of that land and, um, and part of it. And then, so then the, uh, the Northwest the beltway is supposed to go through some of that land. And from that, um, so I guess when I was in high school, they were out, they started going out and putting out markers where the beltway was going to go through. And then, um, so I used to go out there and kind of like kick down the markers. And um, <laughs> then I later heard my grandfather did the same thing. Cause he was, he was <laughs> um, and 
I don't know, so that kind of stuck with me, but also just played music, and I don't know, you know, played some music with some guys, and then in high school, and we decided, I don't know, we were just kind of idealistic, and like, like we're, we're not going to go to college, we're just going to play music and kind of see how things go, and short, long story short, we kind of we ended up uh, renting this building, old meatpacking factory in downtown, but somehow we ended up, you know, we didn't have any money by chance with another guy, this older guy who had some money, he was a carpenter in town, one of the guys worked with, we were able to buy that building for pretty cheap, and then we kind of just fixed it up on our own, not knowing building codes, not doing, you know, anything, you know, just kind of doing it, and so that turned into the warehouse, which turned into like PS211, which became Cranky's, and now it's the Warehouse Art Hotel and Cranky's, and there's all kinds of stuff there. So I lived there for about 12 years, and was just part of the community there. And uh, at some point I got real interested in, you know, I just kind of did a lot of sound, and <laughs> was always around music, and that was great, but I kind of got tired of it, and I was like, well, what am I gonna do? And, um, I don't know, it was kind of just, I remember I had jury duty and I was reading this book on biomimicry, it was just about different ways that people use uh, sort of like mimic nature and uh, read about like West Jackson Land Institute and how they were trying to breed perennial grains and uh, I don't know, I just felt like plants were the way just far as far as the way towards trying to, that I could get from there to some way, some way to preserve either that specific land that was my grandparents' land and just like in general preserve nature. Um, so since I was tied, still I felt like real tied and married to the warehouse, I went to Forsyth Tech here and um, just took horticulture classes to learn and just kind of read all I could and did that for a while and finally just felt like I needed to try to get my hands dirty somehow. I did a few different, did a container gardens like up on the roof and then we did stuff um, in the back lot, um, Marcus was kind of around for, yeah. for that little bit. We had chickens back there. And tried to do a garden, vegetable garden was harder just because the soil was, it was an old coal pit. Um, so it really wasn't the greatest place to, to do a garden, but uh, we had a little greenhouse back there and tried starting stuff and did that for about a year. My friend Jay and then uh, my grandmother had kind of gone to, she had developed dementia and wasn't living in her house anymore and the, the farm was there. And my mom and my aunt weren't sure what to do with the, hey, there was this farmhouse and barn and, all, and some land right there. And so Jay and I proposed to my mom and my aunt that we go live out there and try to, um, try to start like a market farm. And uh, we didn't really know what we were doing, but we, <coughs> took our chickens from the back lot out there to Poff Town and um, started working on their old vegetable garden where they'd always had a garden and um, did that for a couple of years and fixed up the milk parlor and had some, had some meals out there and had people come out. And Sika had an event out there one time. I don't know, we had a lot of like kind of community stuff. It was pretty cool. But uh, it was also, we didn't also know what we were doing. It was really hard to make money, you know, doing that, we learned a lot, but it was kind of a big failure too, but um, I kind of learned the most from that, from that um, whole period of time. So simultaneously to, uh, to working on the farm out there, start trying to start a farm, I got a job at Old Salem and started, I guess in 2009, I just started volunteering there because I'd seen their seed saving program um, through with classes, uh, field trips for some of the horticulture for site tech classes that I've been in. And, um, just was really interested and it was the closest place to where I lived, um, where I could get any kind of experience. You know, if I wasn't tied to that building, I would have just gone and tried to work on an organic farm or gone with it or something. But, um, so I went there and volunteered for a year and then a part-time job opened up there, so I got a job, and that kind of turned into a full-time job eventually. Um, so yeah, so that's what I, where I ended up, where I am now. Um, 
feel pretty lucky to grow vegetables and have it be my daytime job and not have to worry about trying to go to market and I don't know, the stress of the business side of it has been really like stressed me out. I didn't feel like I was good at it. Um, so, uh, but yeah, I feel lucky to be there at Old Salem where we have a, we have, we grow all like, all our vegetable varieties are pre-1850 varieties. So we have safe seed of all these different, you know, there's about 120 different vegetables and herbs and grains and then about that many um, flowers as well that we grow. And then plus we have a lot of native plants and um, just a re rich history of uh, plants there in Salem with all the botanists that used to live in Salem and they have a lot of records so we have a lot of the, just the natural life that was there. And, um, so yeah, that's what I mean. I will say that particular period of having the um, black lot garden at the warehouse was interesting just because every once in a while you see a chicken running down 4th Street. Well, thank you for sharing that. I, I, I don't often get to hear like the backstories and why, like, why anyone's where they are, but especially for our farmers and food producers. And, and so that's, that's enlightening. I feel like a real privilege to hear you know, how you all got to where you're at. Um, but with where you're at uh, and, and what you're currently working on, I'm really curious to hear how, I guess more about how that ties into visions of community for you. Like how do you, how does what's to say as a whole or beyond and other kind of just people kind of pull into that vision of what you're trying to do. Um, no, that doesn't make sense and I can clarify. But if you want to run with that, feel free. <laughs> um, let's start with that. Yeah, they add on today. <clears throat> um, how my experience correlates with others to <coughs> create a bigger piece. Yeah, kind of just like, what's your vision of community that your work's leading up to? Your work is kind of encompassing. How does this, how does this factor into community work for you? I think it would, um, I think it would turn to an agricultural uh, community demonstration. Like they have what they call the agri hood. But almost what you explained with, um, what's that, in Georgia? Yeah. 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 I would like to see like a community that was returned to its, what they call agrarian roots, where the um, people grew their own food more, the supermarkets weren't as much in power, and food stamps wasn't that much of a factor. And um, people got outside, you know, children ate healthy food straight from the garden. Uh, neighbors had types of cooperatives going amongst themselves. Um, I guess this return to simpler times, make America great again. How do you how do you feel like how do you feel like the uh, the work that you're doing in, in the island is heading in that direction? It's a long shot. Um, it's always like a roll of the dot when you have to depend on others to, you know, um, grant you the power to do what you what your dream is. You know what I mean? But what we're trying to do, I guess I could say, is build more of a ar stronger argument and even build leverage just by developing some of the assets we have in our own community. So then maybe the city could consider us. Okay, they are. Um, someone who can be reckoned with. You know, if you don't come with anything, they're gonna immediately put you on a program. But if you have something, maybe we can say, okay, we can meet somewhere in the middle. But at one time we didn't want to meet. You know what I mean? But now I guess we're getting more civilized, refined, you know what I mean? And um we're coming around, you know what I mean? So uh, I like to see a community that uh, if it doesn't have a character per se that is positive that it can really hold to, um, create one, and then uh, hold to that. You know what I mean? So that's kind of where we're at. We're kind of creating a new standard for ourselves, and um, 
you know, in my mind, it would always be agricultural. So that's, that's kind of how I see it. And it being seen in other communities. I mean, it might not exactly be an agricultural thing in the next community, but just the spirit of self-determination. You know what I mean? We can all eat. We might grow your food. We might provide us the technology. Yeah. Or we might provide us the sustainability from a governmental type of uh, format mm -hmm. or, you know, housing, whatever the case may be. We want to be in control of our food. You know what I mean? If nothing else, we want to be in control of our food and to help to help balance the community with other great farmers. You know what I mean? We're just we're just aligning ourselves with um, super super superpowers. You know what I mean? And then once they see that it happens, you know, so they're looking at it like it's covert, but it's really natural that you know all the activity takes place under the ground as roots. And as they establish themselves, then, you know, we're getting the pop-ups. And um, hopefully those are spears and, and flowers and plumes that, that, if you will, you know, provide something of, of, of a fragrance of ease to the community. Because if we've never seen it before, we don't know. So maybe we can create something that's never been seen in this generation. You know what I'm saying? I don't know. That's, that's what I, I would like to be a part of. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, Eric, for you know, your work at Old Salem, so much of it is you know, deeply educational. There's also a lot of preservation there. Uh, I know you're starting to work with volunteers regularly. Mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you see that kind of core work with the, with the gardens, with the, the seed saving, um, kind of adding to benefiting that larger just sense of community for the air around you, air around Old Salem. Yeah, um, I mean, one, just like the kids come in there and have a, and, um, just have an experience either in the gardens or, you know, uh, especially locally. I mean, like all the fourth grade kids all over North Carolina come yeah. to Old Salem <laughs> in a year. But, um, like, just with like the Ken Carlson Boys School, Boys and Girls Club, kids, they have a garden and they always come a few times a year um, where I feel like they kind of feel, feel like those kids kind of feel like a little sense of ownership mm -hmm. and like real familiarity with the gardens there because like we've gone and we've like checked out the trees and the fruit that's there and the dye plants and um, you know, and the garden, oh, they just had a lot of experiences there. So I feel like that's been real good. And, um, the other way was really just like the seeds, like, I don't know, since we save a lot of seed, we get them out, like we have a seed swap every year and that get, kind of gets out to the community. Um, a lot of community garden folks come and get seeds. And um, I don't know, like, my hope is that some of those, some of the things <coughs> we grow are, I don't know, we've kind of like gone through like a lot of different varieties of things that we have there, but like kind of end up with the ones, I have, I've kind of gravitated towards growing the stuff that I see does really well and is like the easiest, the hardiest to grow and like those I feel good about getting those seeds out because I know they're going to do good right. in our community. Right. Um, and I also have dreams about kind of where we Right now, the way since it's like sort of historic preservation of seed varieties, we feel like you know you take real care to be like real pure with your variety and don't let things cross and stuff. I kind of want to just do some letting it all cross yeah. <laughs> and create more diverse gene pools that people can sort of like it's sort of a real diverse breeding pool that people could then select from and like you know. If they're saving seeds, you know, in your place, you go and save some, and like you might get something to be unique for your place, but kind of rooted in this, all this, all these varieties that have been around. That, um, you know, there's tons of varieties to choose from now, you know, but as far as something that's real rooted in our local, um, <coughs> and then we've been trying to like preserve um, some of the lo regional heirlooms too, sort of a seeds with stories project that's. Kind of goes along with it where if anyone who has 
family heirlooms have been passed down to them. We've been trying to document the story a little bit and, and grow up the seeds if, if we can at all say it more and get them out to people. And, uh, because, you know, those are just seeds that are just well adapted to here. Um, I think that's real important, just more as like the food security of the community. Yeah, but, that's awesome. I love the idea about just moving straight towards that type of position and mm -hmm. seeing what kind of organic they just naturally. Yeah, I mean, I'm an experimental person at heart, I think, and like just seeing that kind of, yeah. like I just want And you get this, oh, there's a picture up there of going through of like some cow peas that are all like, that mm -hmm. crossed at one point and like, it was two different, you know, kind of uniform strains, but then you got all these colors that come out in patterns, and like, wow. you know, it's just like this whole like diverse rainbow of like different types of cow peas, and like yeah. that just like captured my imagination. Mm -hmm. so. oh, it's an interesting side project to go find some more funding for. <laughs> um, as the department expands, mm -hmm. uh, Natalie, I know you've. Uh, Farmer, you have a CSA going, which kind of is naturally a community project in, in, in name, um, but also working with you know, some refugee community and you know, just a fairly. There's lots of community out there. There is, yeah. yeah, yeah. And I feel like I'm always like writing that word down, <coughs> and it's just like community is being like, it's, it's, it's what we use. But anyway, you're, the work that you're doing is, is kind of pulling from all these really interesting different directions. Do you have a a kind of vision of, of lately, like this winter, winter time is like my vacation, so I got a couple months to just break away and do whatever I want and switch it up a little bit. And um, this year, there's some random thing popped up on Facebook CrossFit Challenge, and I was like, so anyhow, I tried the CrossFit Challenge, <laughs> I did not achieve it. But it was kind of a, an insight to the health communities, and there are tons in Winston Salem. And I kind of the tagline of um, Sun Gold Farm is healthy soils, healthy people, healthy or healthy food, healthy people. And I, I've kind of I didn't get into farming because of health reasons. I got into it because I just really like to do it. And I didn't even eat that food. I would just go and make my burritos and then <laughs> get to sell that. And so then just kind of tying into like, now I don't know what I would do without it. I, you know, I, like winter time, I'm just like pulling, I got a deep freezer finally last year. And then I just eat now constantly, like whatever I can put away. Or I've learned, I've learned over the years how to, how to eat more of my food. Right. But it's kind of an interesting. So I think like the health component has become like as you see more and more people turning up in the markets that have all these health conditions and that are kind of figuring out how to, you know, self medicate through food, which just makes the most sense and uh, more prevention. So I feel like there's definitely a vision of, of health and a and I've heard one way of like the best way to be a healthier person is just to hang out and have friends that are doing healthy things. So I think having that community of like active lifestyles and and uh, where everything meets, all the good stuff meets, and then just you have a better community. So I'm trying to figure out how to make that more tangible. But yeah, the farmers market. There's a great scene every Saturday. We're at the Dixie Classic Fairgrounds and at the um, Old Salem Cobblestone Market, and that's kind of like a scene where. You know, people at the Old Salem anyway, they're at, at Dixie, people are in to shop and then they head out. And then Old Salem, I feel like the more lingering and then the more like in great, like community happens where people just kind of hang around. And so I think that's really been fun to watch from behind the table. And then also just having uh, like, uh, um, you've mentioned that I work with some ladies from Burma and then having their community and that what, they're eating and we have like Friday kind of potlucks where we all kind of bring something for, cause that's our big harvest day and my parents come out and help and so it's a lot of fun. And so we're learning about like all the different kinds of pickled things. Like for example, they leave the turnip greens and they don't care a darn thing about the turnip, but they, they just want the greens and they don't want the green greens. They want to let it like wilt into the yellow face and then they pickle that. And so it's really been interesting like learning like all the different things that that they really go for, like the, the tendrils and the and the squash plant, like the fuzzy part. So they, that's, um, for a little while, I was selling some at the, um, you're familiar with the, the, I think it's an Asian, no, Ohm Indian Grocery on Haynes Mall Boulevard. So they've got, Thursdays is their vegetable day. So people just 
just know that that's the day to shop for vegetables over there, mm -hmm. and you can find some more interesting things there. But um, yeah, so for a little while we're selling squash tendrils at the home menu grocery, which is fun. Because there's a lady who makes samosas there, and so if you want a really nice samosa on Thursday, mm -hmm. stop by there. <laughs> but um, yeah, so I see a future in like a more a health or health oriented community. Um, I really like these international, like I just like meeting people and seeing how they interact with people from all over the world. But um, this past year, I got a jute mallow. It's kind of like a succulent uh, green that grows. I'm interested in green things that grow in the summertime because the our heat kind of prevents that. So then you get creative, like where else in the world are they growing greens all year round? So we're big advocates of sweet potato greens, which flashed up at one point. Um, I learned about that in Mali, but this year we're growing the jute mallow the, the past year, and it's an Egyptian, call an Egyptian spinach, and it's kind of slimy a little bit, and it takes a little getting used to, but you can eat it raw, and it's really nice, and then you can also just cook it down and with tomatoes and garlic and onions, and, Everything it tastes good with that combination, but it's a it's a lot of fun. So. Are you are do, do some of these new kind of cross pollinated food recommendations make it to like your customers at the farmers market or yeah? And then what's really neat? So um, Mariah Gendry is a um, a Wake Forest grad who also is involved with the Nitro Bank here once in the Beast Volunteer, and she helps out on Saturdays, and her family's from Egypt, and then they call it Molahia. So she get really excited, like her mom got excited about it. So any like any Molahia that didn't sell at the market, like she was bringing back in a cooked form, and I was like, wow, that's, that's awesome. I should just not sell that stuff at all and get it all back. <laughs> but it's really, it's been really neat, like just, when you tap into somebody, like we grow um, like amaranth, you see as a weed everywhere. But in Jamaica, it grows like really big leaves and it, it, there's a variety of cavalu. And so that's another green that you get into like hibiscus flowers, like the tea, the red zinger, one of those, the, the red part is coming from a hibiscus plant. And so there's the, you, you hear somebody with an accent, and then I always have to ask where they're from, and then it's like, oh, do you eat this and this? And then so that, then that sparks the, I love these conversations in the farmer's market. <laughs> it's, it's like, that's where I learn the most about all different kinds of things. Mm -hmm. yeah. so I just went off on another tangent. Mm -hmm. That's perfect. <laughs> um, I'm going to open this up for questions in just a second. My last, and this, this kind of, uh, one, I have one more question. Um, and it kind of stems off of the uh, Michael Twitty talk that we had last month. Um, but are there are there any notable similar that food gets tied to community but also gets tied to identity? Are there any notable recipes or particular ingredients that have been passed down for your families that you really identify with? <coughs> My, my dad's uh, French, and so my <coughs> my grandmother was like, you got to grow these 18-day radishes, and uh, in French is radis 18 jours, and so I was looking for those, and it turned out they call them French breakfast radishes around here, and now they have the ones with the white and then the, the red combination, and so she's the one that kind of played it, like, told me, like, oh, try that, that'll be a fun one, and then, like, whenever I go visit, then there's always something else to bring back home and try. And so she's um, the black radish, that like really long, like gnarly looking thing that you just peel it back and then it's really white on the inside and you just grate it into a salad, like and you make it like a vinaigrette. <coughs> at, at, at lunch at my, my grandmother's house, it's always something raw and delicious and then vinaigrette. And then that's the combination that, that seems to go great for everything. But um, doing that with even with carrots, anything grated and then vinegar. So that's I, I want to you know thank my grandmother and like we Skype. She's 92 years old and she's awesome. But like we we'll, we'll Skype sometimes and just to see what's going on in the garden and give her like the virtual tour with us. So it's nice that they can. Awesome. She's still actively gardening. Uh, no, but she's actively opinionated. So that's. <laughs> 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 Um, I don't know how unique it is. It's not necessarily my family, but like my grandmother used to make gravy and chicken pies 
in Salem, and she was kind of known as a place she could go and stop. Um, she sold eggs and she sold chicken pies. Maybe that was, I think that was it. But yeah, they, she just had, they would keep their their garage open, and even if people weren't there, they knew you could go in and there was like a little can, you could drop your <coughs> and get a chicken pie out of the freezer and grab some eggs. Um, so that was always a, you know, yeah. coming from just like the Arabian thing. So you know how to make the chicken pies? <laughs> I don't know how to make them. <laughs> <laughs> but the whole, you know, all the same old sheer cake and raving cookies yeah. and uh, all that stuff. Yeah. She made, you know, my brother will make, tries to make the cookies now, but. Uh, <laughs> you, do you make them No, uh, no, no. Mm-hmm. I keep telling myself I'm going to worry too, but mm-hmm. I haven't got to it. Do you tell? Michael, you got anything? Yep. Um, <clears throat> I see my easiest answer would be cornbread. Of course, yeah, my yeah. mom goes down the cornbread and the greens and the beans, like the um, traditional yeah. staples. Um, those could be grown right in the garden. We didn't grow up growing in the garden. Um, I can bring a nice bag of greens and stuff she can grow, um, beans. But um, I would attribute most of all my ability to my mom and my stepdad was, who's um, deceased now, but um, they both taught me to take what you got and just whip it up. You know what I'm saying? I really don't use um, recipes like that. I get the most compliments from food. If I go out and just harvest the food, I might get eggplant, onions, greens, I might get everything, you know what I mean? And I just go in there with no plan, just wash it and try to have a positive attitude, you know. I always had to clean up the kitchen first. And um, I just start cooking. And um, it always, most of the time it turns out pretty good. So I attribute that most to, like, I guess you would say, my mom, family. Can you recreate dishes when you do that? Because I feel like I can never retrace my steps. Um, I should be able to, I've got at least five I can recreate, but, um. I am kind of like, I'm at a loss because I've really done some things I know that I'll never be able to redo. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but um, yeah, I think the more, the more I can get some strong varieties, like stuff I had never grown before, I can maybe, I won't be able to recreate, but I can maybe match it. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? I like even like when she said, the uh, slimy greens, yeah. like those are good. Um, I grew Malabar like that one time too, a couple mm-hmm. years, and um, if you let it grow too big, it gets slimy. But those are good with okra, because the okra kind of just swallowed the, <laughs> swallowed the slimy and stuff. And, um, <laughs> I don't know why this, this tastes good if you put like um, tomatoes uh, with the slime. <laughs> I guess that's why they did it like that. And put the onions in there. And, um, I would even take maybe some, uh, what other ingredient? Um, Something like mushrooms and uh, eggplant, you know what I mean, for your meat. And just maybe take take all your herbs and make something real flavorful, have that suck it up, and then just add that to your pot. If I was good with bread, I'd be good. I'd be, I'd be what they call bad. But I'm not good with bread, so that probably be something I work on next. Yeah. Dumplings and things like that. Awesome. Thank you. I am um, open up for questions real quick. So just so you have time to do it, is there anything that you want to plug for the audience so they should know about volunteer requests or CSA signups or anything? March fifth, we have an open house at the farm and. Uh, it's on Facebook. It'll be more from four to seven. There's potluck tours and um, bluegrass music. So usually <laughs> March and May twenty second. Oh May. Let's see if anyone pays attention. Yeah. Where is it from? It's a uh, forty eighty Thomasville Road, hmm. at one hundred nine. So you pass one hundred nine, you pull it. It's about takes me about 14 minutes from here. So you just mm-hmm. go down to South Street Parkway on the board, and then first exit after 52. And then it'll be on the right, and there'll be signs out, so. 
I mean, we're always looking for volunteers in the gardens. Um, there's a sign-up sheet if anyone's interested. You can learn a lot of different things. Um, yeah, be in touch. Michael, you got anything? Not specifically. Um, I think I would um, employ, implore, I would implore you all to stay involved in your local food um, network and even create some. That's, I think um, the more of a group effort we can get towards it, it'll be like undeniable, you know what I mean? And then that's, that's um, we're really breaking a lot of boundaries and doing it very like organically. But um, I guess that's the most thing I would, I would just, I mean, I'm not here with a list of anything, but uh, maybe um, Marcus, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But um, like, I try to take advantage of every opportunity, even if it's something like seeds, because anybody could take a little pot and grow a tomato plant or, uh, you know, like just if uh, no. Natalie, pardon me. If Natalie had transplants, you know what I mean? And um, you know what I'm saying? I'm not quite at that point. You know what I mean? You can come get the transplants and we can do a lot more as a group than several people. So that's that's the only thing I would add. Thank you. Um, questions? Comments? You guys are sitting there so polite. Do any of you work with uh, neighborhoods or anything like that doing uh, like gardening grow out of five gallon canyons? Stuff like that. I plan, I plan on doing something like that. Um, I've had like buckets. Yeah. And my neighbor, my neighbor, she uses um, five gallon buckets. Mm -hmm. and she grew some nice tomatoes last year. Okay. So um, I just went and got a few t um, buckets. But uh, I mean, I don't, I haven't really put it as a whole program or anything. But at least the people I know, I know not doing too much. I give them a bucket and. You know, a few plants or a planter. But um, yeah, I think that's a good idea to do on the organized level. I'm terrible with house plants. I've killed everything. I was like, I have to have a lot yeah. to take care of. But I feel like the bucket would be dangerous for me. But yeah. No, I think it's awesome to see. I really like seeing that other people's houses. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I guess, question for, for Eric. The, the, um, you do, Frank, but Yanni at Old Salem now has obviously been doing a lot of in terms of getting sort of to reorient the visitor experience to the historic town. Mm -hmm. Is it is it, are there changes afoot in terms of how how kids and, and regular visitors are going to interact with the gardens? Yeah, hopefully we're um, trying to get get the gardens a little bit more on Main Street through like containers, plantings and stuff like that, something he really wants that I'm not so excited about because it's just like warm metal stuff, but it's cool, you know, but um, it'll be it'll be great as far as like people's experience happen, you know, just that's where people are foremost, so like it makes sense to kind of get some plants out there. Um, and we just planted some, some native plants sort of in a prominent, uh, just permanent planting of there, right where people always come by. But uh, we're also gonna try to get more folks out into the the gardens this sort of that you know have some kind of experience. Um, changing the brother single brothers garden um, a little bit, where instead of just doing it as trying to re a recreation of what the single brothers garden would look like, sort of what we have done in the past, we're gonna treat it more like an outdoor museum space. And have each square have different themes. We're gonna have a flower square, a seed square, and then a tree nursery and perennial vegetable square. And then we're gonna the three mm -hmm. other outer lower squares are gonna be all agricultural crops. We have agricultural crops from Africa, agricultural crops from <coughs> the Americas, and then agricultural crops from Europe. Mm -hmm. So we can kind of show that story of just how all these different food crops, how the, how those plants have their own histories too, and how they came, you know. And they start to tell a little bit of, the, of that story a little bit. Um, 
when will we start seeing be able to see that kind of thing? Um, starting this year, full expression next year probably, but uh, we're gonna have some just more <coughs> trying to get more signage out, just a way to like because we're like we're out in the gardens, but we're not always out in the gardens. So lots of times people kind of wander around the garden and I got it looks like some carrots and some or they, they even know what I mean some some I'm surprised some kids especially really have you know now with like <coughs> whatever they use their parents or they work in the community garden or school garden they're like they know their plants pretty well um, that's always kind of cool but uh, yeah hopefully we're gonna try to get where even if we're not out there they, some people can like have an experience um, and get a little more out of the gardens um, and then going further after this year is kind of a transition year but hopefully we'll try to get more like programs and have more like experiences that people can take part of and maybe do some classes and stuff out there but I'm always wanted to know what's done with all the vegetables that you grow in the garden. Yeah um it depends um so we do a lot of seed saving so a lot of us just like we let stuff you know like have lettuce and then we'll let the lettuce go to seed um, so we can save seed from those, you know. Um, so I like to think of it as like saving seed and then we give out that seed and it turns into food later on down the line, but it's just not right there in that. Um, More food. <laughs> yeah. Um, so a lot of it in the Single Brothers Garden, that's sort of what's happening. And then we also, since it's kind of a, a lot of it's sort of displayed in some ways and we're just, we don't have a whole lot of staff. Sometimes we'll leave cabbages for just like, a long time before we get to the point, you know, where if you're treating it like a production garden, you would like harvest it sooner, but I might leave it because it's easier to have something green in the garden just because we're a well, small staff. Um, but then we also we do take <coughs> stuff to the um, to the Old Salem Tavern restaurant and they, they use it so a lot. So especially from the mixed gardens up there, they take a lot and they also prepare food in the hearth kitchen at the niche um, and, and you stuff more directly for interpretive if people get the experience you know taste some sweet potato fritters or something um, but then we, yeah we do um, so that's kind of what happens with it. Yeah. Hey Marcus. Uh, I am interested in starting a community greenhouse. Uh, you know, we have baseball fields, we have basketball courts. We don't have a greenhouse. Um, and I, I used to work for the city. Um, I had a uh, 24 by 96 greenhouse with the city that they weren't using. And I used to take my uh, gardeners from Happy Hill <coughs> to the greenhouse. Um, and it was like an oasis. You know, getting the people out of that environment and getting them into a greenhouse, I mean, the, the affect on the people was unreal. And, you know, we can go to the beach or we can go to the mountains, but a lot of these folks are stuck. You know, they, they don't go. Um, so I would like to see the community get behind a greenhouse where People could come and enjoy being in the greenhouse in the wintertime. Most of y'all that have greenhouses, you know how great it is to have that greenhouse in the wintertime. Uh, it's like going back in the summer. Um, so any ideas that y'all have, you know, I would love to hear that. Um, I've had this dream for about 25 years. I've been doing Horticultural therapy. I am a horticultural therapist, and I've been doing this 30 years. Um, and I just see the difference that gardening makes in a person, and it teaches so many things. I mean, responsibility, commitment, work ethic. You know, I mean, we've lost a lot of this, and a lot of the reason is we've gotten away from the garden. So any ideas, any support, I would appreciate. 
Yes. I think that's my invitation <laughs> to comment. Um, my son and I are starting a family farm at my house in East Lawn Community, yeah. Southeast Winston, mm -hmm. off Thomasville Road. I'm a neighbor of Natalie's now. Well, uh, we just your neighbor of mine. <laughs> <laughs> but I moved there 12 years ago, and my youngest son is 32. So my kids were grown, but I knew the neighborhood was just perfect for a visual uh, kumbaya, you know, to happen. Black, brown, white, um, and Michael's kids, my other son's kids, I have eight grandkids. So we're, we're talking about doing a greenhouse. And um, Michael has helped me design it, and Eric has offered to volunteer maybe some perennials um, to help us. But I would love to invite you to help us too. I don't know what part of town you live in. I would love to. Uh, I'm in Ardmore. Ardmore, okay. But we'll connect, and I would, we were talking about building a greenhouse. I have a neighbor, Francisco from Mexico, who's concerned about whether, you know, his family's even gonna be able to stay here from day to day. But um, he does amazing brickwork and stonework, so he's helping us design the front yard. We have a front yard farm, mainly beans, um, because we have brand human beans which is jelly beans, but we're going to grow actual beans. That's what I wanted to say, too, one last thing. When Michael was talking about what food legacy, um, he knows that his grandfather, my dad, who passed away when he was six, um, from Sumter, South Carolina, brought Papa John into our culinary awareness. And my mother is from Bethania. They met in Winston-Salem, but my mother's sister, um, it's believed in our family that she's the one that baked the first Arabian cookies. Oh, wow. Okay, and my sisters, two older sisters of the eight of us, actually worked at the bakery, you know, in Old Salem. I ended up going to Salem College, you know, so the thing of Arabian um, culture is very familiar from childhood, but Hoppin' John and Arabian cookies. Yeah, and now I eat ginger snaps from Food Lion, but it's still <laughs> <laughs> About the greenhouse, uh, this is my first year using one of those hoop vendors, mm -hmm. and so I just built like a small one because I really needed one on a new place, and so it still doesn't quite have the heat figured out yet, so it's a work in progress, but it's enough to get by, but it's like a 15 by 30. And so that's all with the hoops front, like those top rails. And so, like a high tunnel? I've got, I've got I know, a couple grants for a high tunnel. This is smaller. Okay. Because it's, I think the high tunnel needs like those really big steel posts and we don't. Okay. But I think something huge needs to happen for that project. Like the little stuff is nice, but I, I think that's a great. Well, you, you think about all the sports fields we have in this town. Yeah. And not one greenhouse. Not one community agricultural place. There are some conversations developing with uh, the city's uh, Parks and Rec mm -hmm. about uh, potentially repurposing some of the underutilized park space mm -hmm. for growing spots. Um, I'm not sure what kind of potential there really is there, but uh, there, there are a number of places in town, especially in some of the lower, lower access communities that they just have really underused people's park space and it could be perfect growing space or that's that could be added on to that conversation. I think it's a great idea. There was there was talk that they were gonna do a hydroponic greenhouse. Right. And I've heard that, mm -hmm. that has fallen through. Yeah. So, you know, I, I would just like to see a traditional greenhouse right. that might not have to have all these other components. I mean hydroponics is the thing today. But who's going to really have access to a lot of that? They've got their backyard, right? You know, and um, uh, they had planned a huge hydroponic greenhouse over near Kimberly Park. Did you hear about that, Michael? Yes, ma'am. Okay. I, believe, I did. Yeah. That's really. Um, I ain't gonna say that, but um. <laughs> what happened? You said like this. Um, <laughs> Our goal is to feed people, you know what I mean? We're not in a competition trying to 
Now, if I was like caught up in that vibe right there, it'd be too no avail, you know what I mean? So I'm saying that to say, we've been slow growing. And just like Marcus just said, he said it perfect. Now that's how cool that's supposed to be. Um, there's some talks beginning about having some, uh, using the space in public, you know, the public spaces, for these types of things. That's about as much as, much as we can say right now, but as a gardener, you know that's a lot for a gardener to say. So the seed is definitely there, you know, just like everything we're doing in our backyards and the properties we got, um, those are all microcosms of a, of a macrocosm, a bigger piece. So our yards are really just practice, you know what I mean? You know, um, I'm striving to get a little wind tunnel in my yard. My mom wants a wind tunnel or a greenhouse. Um, but these parks, you know, Winston Salem is 10 years, 20 years behind everybody. They already doing these things in other cities. So our goal is to do it responsibly. I feel like the ones who tried the Kimberly project, they did it because it was the thing that was popping at the time, but um, they didn't use a lot of foresight. I just feel privileged that we have a group. This is much, we're much more expensive than us. But uh, even knowing that Winston Salem has more community gardens than Greensboro High Point. We're ahead in a lot of ways, mm -hmm. but now to pull this piece together, right. we have an Urban Food Policy Council. It's almost, if you're the hungriest city in the world, mm -hmm. we say in the world, you know what I'm saying? If you're the hungriest city in the world, you're supposed to have, you got the most churches in the world, right. you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So you should have the most, maybe food access, you know what I'm saying? We shouldn't be the hungriest, you know what I'm saying? So we're just gonna use common sense, we're gonna use our voice, we're gonna use collectivity, and we're gonna really advocate that this should be, in my mind, I'm pretty sure my, my cohorts, we think this should be the right of everyone to be able to have access to food and even make a couple of dollars um, working with the food mm -hmm. instead of just being at the corner store waiting for some change. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of our people going through that. It's not by choice. You know, it could be a lot of people if they, if they weren't <clears throat> quite as lucky or fortunate, but a couple of bad turns of, of, of chance and people end up homeless, don't really have a way out, it's a slippery slope. Once you get the L, you really gotta be kind of lucky to get out here and be successful. So it's incumbent upon myself to be speaking for ones who can't speak for themselves, not because they don't have the voice, because they don't have the time to show up. You know what I mean? A lot of them, we don't have a greenhouse. We gotta run to the grocery store and put coins together. So. I look forward to where recreation that mean, you know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah. Recreation actually means yeah. recreating something, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? That should be what the recreation center is about, you know what I mean? A Bitcoin can maybe be a Bitcoin, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know what I mean? Let's get back to things that really multiply, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? So just using common sense, mm -hmm. it's, it's definitely going to happen. Do you, do you know what has happened with the Liberty Street market? Um, I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't a community effort. It was again a situation where people saw that this was the thing that was very popular, mm -hmm. and it was a means that people could seem like they were goodwill. But I don't like to talk negative, but you'll see who stays with it. I met this man at the front of the door at the uh, advocating for the urban farm ordinance. I'm just meeting Eric. Natalie, I've known throughout, just like yourself, throughout several gardening situations. So the ones who are actually about that life, you know what I mean? Um, I think they'll become more evident and even more, uh, for lack of a better term, dominant. You know what I'm saying? A lot of the recessive traits that we attribute to even race, you'll see who is original. I always imagine original people being more uh, people who produce. You know what I'm saying? So that's that's what I embrace and that's that's I don't really see a way not to be um, successful in that. That's, that's how I see it. Well, it, it's really an untapped resource for farmers. Um, it is. And people over in those areas growing vegetables could take advantage of that. You know, yeah. to sell to their neighbors. Yeah, um, it's, it's beautiful over there. The, 
It, it's had management issues, and one of the things that, that I would personally like to work on with the Winston's New Urban Food Policy Council is just um, finding funds for a dedicated market manager for both that and the Dixie Classic. Because um, the, the management's been one of the issues around it. Um, but yeah, I can't just keep saying that. 